Welcome everyone to Unlocking the Potential of GPUs, a webinar on Q&A on GPU optimization. My name's J.R. Rodriguez. The people you see here on the stage are from GSI Software, Geisel Software, Inc. Geisel Software is a custom software engineering firm that specializes in robotics, medical equipment, and Internet of Things. We are a prime contractor to NASA. We're a prime contractor to the VA. We're a subcontractor to the Army through Teledyne FLIR, and we're also a subcontractor to NASA through Raytheon Space Systems. On the commercial side, we do work for Amazon Robotics, iRobot, Medica, and a long list of other well-known commercial providers. What we're going to cover today in this exciting webinar is the architecture of modern GPUs, GPU capabilities and relevant applications, the art of GPU optimization, including a live demo, and then we're going to have an open Q&A session. If we have enough time, we'll get to as many questions as we can. We have an impressive team of GPU experts who consistently develop and deliver high-performance GPU solutions. I am really excited to be able to introduce you today to two of our GPU gurus, Steve Phillips and Bailey Sostek, who you can see on the screen. They're here to share their knowledge and experience with us. We have just a little housekeeping to do first. The bottom left hand of your screen, you'll see a, a link to be able to download resources like our accelerated computing capability sheet and our blog article about GPU optimization. Again, anytime you have a question during this webinar, go to your Q&A panel, enter the question, and we will queue it up for an answer uh, in the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We're gonna get right to it now, but first we're gonna publish a quick poll for you to give us your opinion on, uh, on a topic regarding GPUs. And while you're doing that, I'd like to introduce you to Steve Phillips, a highly skilled engineer with a passion for optimizing imaging and machine vision algorithms. Steve graduated from MIT in 1985 and has since built a successful career in application and system level software engineering. He's particularly adept at developing native GPU kernels for various graphical processing tasks. And his incredible talents have even led to the creation of a 3D imaging algorithm that improved performance by an unbelievable 700 times over C++. And with that, let me introduce Steve Phillips. Thank you, JR, and thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, we hope we'll have a few interesting things to tell you today. Um, uh, there are so many uses of GPUs and applications. I'd like to focus on one particular area, which is uh, integrating uh, neural networks and 3D image processing to construct accurate models of the world. So today uh, we have tremendous capability, uh, hardware capability, but AI systems also have tremendous needs. Autonomous systems need to be able to, to make decisions in real time, recognize objects, and, uh, and react quickly. Now, neural networks typically work on two-dimensional images, such as camera images, and you can, you can detect objects uh, around through, through, through machine learning techniques but it can be very useful to integrate that into the 3D view of the world. So we've written custom GPU kernels, which work together with a neural network to, to, to develop and maintain these, these models of the, the real world environment. So in this uh, section, we'll cover uh, that first, that topic, coordination of neural networks with 3D point cloud-based modeling. We'll run through a quick machine learning scenario and finish with a few tips for writing high-performance GPU algorithms. So neural networks in themselves are ideal candidates for GPU acceleration. 
they they perform sequences of operations on, uh, uh, for example, image based, uh, as we're speaking about today, will will perform processes such as convolution to get a different perspective on the input data. So at the right, you see an an, an edge detection convolution kernel, which takes the original image and gives uh, another piece of data for the for the neural net to to use in its decision makings and there are usually multiple convolution kernels every one of these you're doing uh eight multiply nine multiplies and and eight additions so there's lots of low level math a perfect uh, uh candidate for a gpu now fortunately deep learning the the, the popular deep learning inference engines like, such as tensorflow and pytorch have this built in so you can you don't have to do a lot of extra work to gain the benefits of gpu now, in neural nets, you, you, there are different needs between the training and deployment phases of a neural net. That, that when you're training, you've got a large data set, you're iterating repeatedly. It might take hours or days to, trans, to, to, to train a neural net. But when you're deployed, you have a different set of requirements. You need to, you're only recognizing one set of things at a time and your model is already trained, but you usually have real time constraints. And often if, if you want to be doing AI on, the, on your edge IoT device, it's in a limited environment where you don't have as much power. So uh, it's very important to have efficient models, especially in the runtime uh, environment. But neural nets are great for both both training and deployment stages. Um, now, in it is possible to develop a, a, a products that that rely can completely on two dimensional neural networks. So you can have eight cameras mounted on your vehicle, and each camera can look out and say, "I see a." Squ Squirrel and they and they all talk to each other and figure out where things are going, but you add much more power if you're able to integrate that into a 3D, a unified 3D model of the world around you. It allows you to to verify what your what your neural networks are telling you. They detect it lets you uh, and and just in general it lets you do things like determine position and orientation, motion much better. So. Um, when you when you start with a 3D sensor that's inputting data, you can then map the 2D objects onto that 3D data and get 3D models of the particular objects that you're you're looking at. If you detect a bicycle you, in the 2D data, you can then uh, take that section of data, map that onto the 3, 3D point cloud, and you have a 3D bicycle to to look at. So you can then use that to uh, to calculate the dimensions, uh, position, orientation uh, in 3D space. So it's very helpful. Now, a typical product scenario, this is a bit of a mythical one, but a supermarket checkout scanner that's completely automated. So you put your items on the belt, they, they run down. Uh, it has an overhead camera uh, for, for 2D color imaging, and that's what's used by the neural net to to uh, and then it also has depth sensing cameras or or lidar or some sort of a 3D imaging component that that builds a 3D uh, point cloud model a, a a group of points in 3D spaces and finally this has a robotic arm for bagging the groceries. So the implementation of this uh, happens in in a couple of stages. First of all, you take the 2D color uh, camera data image and you know your inventory for, for your store, that which limits your, your space of objects that you need to identify. And you allow your, your neural network to discover and, and describe all of the candidate objects it sees on the screen. So then for each of these objects, you project that data onto the 3D point cloud, which you've obtained through your, your LIDAR scanner or whatever, and that will give you a 3D representation of that object. So if you have a soda can or something, you'll actually have the cylindrical shape there. Then uh, using, using custom GPU algorithms, you can then look, examine that point cloud and by by a series of sweep rotations and, and orientation transformations, you can 
determine the orientation that that object is is at. You can also sanity check things like dimensions. You you know what size this can should be. So it if you see a discrepancy, it gives you a, it effect allows you to uh, uh, to affect the confidence level of the identification. So once you've figured out that you you have a can that's that's or a, or a, or a candy bar or whatever object at a particular orientation that's enough information for the robotic arm to be able to reach down and grasp that object and note that there's usually also a tracking component involved you've identified an object it's moving down this belt or whatever and it may shift in position or whatever so you have uh, your 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 code is is adjusting to follow these objects as you move along and so together, by combining the 2D and 3D data, you gain much more functionality than because the, the, the neural net can tell you you have this object here, but then the, applying the 3D data gives you all the information about the geometry and, 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 and dimensions of the object. Um, so there are many scenarios like this. Um, in, industrial production is typical where you're, uh, for, for example, if you have a, a neural net that can identify uh, good, good fruit from rotten fruit or something, it can be part of a high-speed production line uh, and, and automatically doing a sort, uh, things along those lines. Um, and it, this applies to, to autonomous vehicle navigation. There are many situations where you want to construct that real world uh, model. Now, um, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit now about maximizing GPU performance. A lot of the work we, I've been doing specifically has been in CUDA for NVIDIA processors, but there are, there are many ways to access uh, GPUs. Uh, some of the higher level heterogeneous models are, are, will, will run across multiple GPUs. So there are a lot of tricks that you or, or tips that you, and techniques you can use at the low level to optimize a particular GPU algorithm, which are very important. But I want to start with the, the concept um, in optimization, the best way to optimize a routine is never to call it in the first place. And the lesson here is that you want to make sure from a big picture view that you're optimizing the big picture items as well as, as the nuts and bolts of of tuning a particular algorithm to run faster. So uh, the, the key concepts here are keep the GPU busy. In, in other words, have data ready for it as soon as you possibly can uh, uh, efficiently so that the GPU can, can grab the next piece of data and start working on it as soon as it's ready to and not sitting idle. And also, you need to you want to structure your tasks so that you can use as many of the G, the computing cores as possible. You might have a GPU that has uh, has five thousand, ten thousand, sixteen thousand cores in it, and in order to efficiently use that GPU, you you need to break your task into sixteen thousand pieces or whatever, or part of your GPU is sitting idle. So uh, that that involves structuring your algorithms to really maximize the usage of the GPU. Now the most common and and bottleneck in GPU processing is getting things from here to there, getting data from CPU memory into GPU memory, loading data from GPU memory into the GPU registers and back, uh, and and dealing with when when you have a, a whole bunch of you have thousands of threads trying to access this memory at once that you can have real bottlenecks there. So most of the nuts and bolts optimizations of of when you get down into the that level are in thinking about how memory is being used around and how you can make it be accessed efficiently and and smoothly. Um, and one of the keys to this is that when you do have data you're working on in the GPU, you want to be able to load it into those registers, do as much work as possible before you put it out, and so that so that you can avoid these intermediate stages of writing back to memory and reading in again. And that's by far the single most important thing that you can do to optimize GPU performance, be very aware of memory usage and how it's being done. Now, on 
So we've, we've already touched on the first uh, of, in terms of maximizing GPU performance, breaking tasks into small pieces to keep all of the processing units busy. So for example, you might have a task that involves rotating a 3D point cloud uh, among a couple of thousand candidate orientations to see which best fits the dimensions of an object. So if, if, if you have 5,000 positions you're going to try, you will only use up 5,000 cores unless you structure your algorithm so that you can run subsets of that point cloud and, and have each thread process less than the complete point cloud and the orientation. And so you can tune those parameters by how much you, how small you break a task down into to, to gain an optimal number of threads to perform the operation to load the, the GPU as, as you desire to. Um, there are, GPU threads like to be coordinated and, and uh, we, in this can be as simple as making sure that threads access contiguous memory. So it in, for example, you might, if you're iterating through a 2D video image, it, it can be useful. It might be better to have the threads access multiple areas of the same row of data rather than having each thread pursue a different row. So memory organization and choosing which which uh, which memory each thread accesses in what order can can produce uh, ver uh, dramatic benefits to, depending on what GPU you're using. Um, the the other area you want to minimize branches in your threads because when you when you do if you have multiple GPU threads running and one of them takes a branch and the other doesn't your threads aren't really running in lockstep anymore so it's not it's not impossible to do but but whenever you can if you can take special cases out of the ma in main GPU loop you can get uh, big benefits an example of this is when you're processing a tiled image and so you need to do if you're convoluting for example where you might the edge pixels might cross over into a different tile so you have to do extra work the uh, a good way to do that is to have the gpu algorithm process the interior of the tile and then once that's finished you can handle that special case in in your c plus plus code or on the cpu to just fill in around the corner and so you're you're offloading some of the the, the detail work and the uh, the small edge work and in order to make the central kernel run uh, more smoothly and now most many many systems that integrate neural networks and 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 3D or 2D image processing with GPUs have a lot of components to them. You might have multiple neural nets doing object detection. Um, um, you might have some preparation of the data. You might have object tracking going on. And so all of these pieces are working sort of independently and in parallel as well. So you really want to make sure that you can exploit that level of parallelism at the top level. And one good way to do this is to make sure that between the different stages, you use queues that that so that it's not a one-to-one. -one. The GPU doesn't have to wait for the other stage to finish a job before it starts processing it. But instead, uh, if, you, if you're processing the data, you can pile up multiple tasks for the GPU and while it's off doing other things, and then the GPU can come and do two or three things in a row while you're processing the next thing. So making sure that you use, uh, that you decouple those set sets of uh, of feeding data and processing it and on the same uh, on the back side it's true as well when the gpu is finished doing something it's got some data that needs further processing it doesn't want to have to wait to hand that data back off to you it wants to go off and do the next piece of work that it's doing so it queues up the data and it goes off and does that so the the conclusion of this is that you really want to think very carefully about your big picture organization, how the, the components are, are interacting and to, to make the processes run smoothly together to gain as much parallelism as you can out of it. So um, a couple of uh, points to conclude with. Um, Neural networks and custom GL, GPU algorithms really work hand in hand to, to gain what 
what neither one of them could do by itself. It's no good if you have a 3D world vision of the world if you don't know what you're looking at. And so the neural and 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 also with the neural network, it's of limited value to know there's an object in front of you if you don't know how far it is. You have to guess how far it is, where how fast it's moving, whatever. And so by doing the combination of of one or more neural nets running with that 3D world model construction, you gain a very powerful model, which can help tremendously. For optimization, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. You, you need to optimize every step of the process because if it doesn't matter how fast your GPU kernels are running, if you have one bottleneck process, that's going to dominate performance. And so often developing GPU algorithms is a concept of a, 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 an iteration of getting rid of the worst problem and then seeing what the next bottleneck is and, and working down from there. And high level architectural decisions make a big difference there, but the, the key is to, to focus on your actual bottlenecks, your observed bottlenecks, and don't rather than uh, just theorizing about what will work. Because sometimes the only way to know how well an optimization will work is to implement it and try it and see what else uh, pops up as a bottleneck. Uh, so the benefits of this increased performance in the when as as GPUs get faster, not only are are you getting performance improvements, but you're also getting smarter. Your AIs, when, when they can process data faster, that means you can throw larger data sets at them, um, more modeling, more processing steps, and, and increase the intelligence. So every cycle that you can save with an efficient GPU implementation of, of the work around it allows you to increase the capacity and capabilities of your, your neural nets, which are the, 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 con, the key to, to AI uh, uh, performance. Um, so uh, I hope this is uh, interesting and please uh, ask any questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Steve, thank you so much for your techniques and tips on GPU optimization. Uh, what's especially impressive is the fact that you've been doing this for years on literally scores of projects. So your uh, techniques, your tips are real world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're now gonna publish another poll, but we love to get your input and feedback. And while you're answering that poll, what I'd like to do is introduce you to Bailey Sostek, our next presenter. Uh, Bailey's a talented software engineer at Geisel Software. Uh, after he graduated from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, he honed his skills at Salvas Global and Philips Healthcare, uh, where he was contributing to the latest generation of ultrasound machines. Bailey's currently pursuing a master's degree in computer science where he's been working on a cutting edge framework that optimizes GPU programs through parallelization. He's about to demonstrate how this impressive leading edge technology can revolutionize the world of multi-agent systems like Swarm Robotics by allowing literally millions of agents to interact in real time. Welcome. Bailey Sostek. Thank you, JR. Uh, oh, my presentation started in the middle a little bit. I'm just gonna go back to the beginning here. Okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction, JR. My name is Bailey Sostek, as was mentioned. I'm currently a master's student at WPI and I'm working full-time at Geisel Software. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this project I've been working on for my thesis called Apiary. Um, it's an open source technology and the goal of it is to be a platform agnostic and GPU agnostic tool that can be used to create multi-agent simulations. Uh, some of the target domains are cellular automata and multi-agent systems, and we think that it could also be adapted to things like swarm robotics. Um, and I'm just going to kind of get into the specific details about it. Um, I have solved some problems that are kind of interesting to me, and I need to give you guys a little bit of background about how OpenGL works and some of the inner workings so I can reveal what problems arise when you try to create a multi-agent simulation and how 
um, how they would kind of break unless you're really careful with how you structure your data. And I'm going to progress down that train of thought to the point where I'm showing some demonstrations uh, about how simulations are run. And we'll see some more images and videos like the one that you can see on your screen here. This is a simulation that I'm running in my framework. I ran this on an RTX 3080, and I was able to simulate about 100 million agents at around 30 frames per second. Um, and this is just a, a still frame from that simulation. So now I'm going to transition into kind of talking about what OpenGL is. Um, at a very high level, OpenGL is a graphics API that allows your computer to control the specific hardware device in your computer called the GPU. Um, it's an interface that allows you to control what data exists in the GPU and what you are asking the GPU to do specifically. Um, so there are specific hooks in OpenGL in your CPU code that allow you to structure what data you're asking to be sent to the GPU. And then the GPU can hold this data internally and process it in some way. So when you're actually asking the GPU to render something on the screen, you're going to invoke a draw call. And that tells the GPU to take its data and just draw it to the screen. So the result of that might be something like this, where it's just rendering an image directly to the screen. But we can do a lot with OpenGL to, dis to configure what we're actually asking to be displayed. So in this uh, example, I'm just rendering some spheres uh, with a physically based rendering model. And um, I'll kind of talk a little bit more about what that even means. So how do you control what shows up on the screen? Well, you need to really specify precisely what you want the GPU to do. There's a lot of different little programs that exist in OpenGL and are uploaded onto the GPU called shaders. Uh, on the screen here, I have an example of three shaders, which are very commonly used. Uh, geometry shader is kind of the first step of shaders where you're consuming uh, vertice or point data and you can kind of transform that data in some way. You can add more points, remove points, um, or just completely restructure uh, the points in general. You can apply transforms and things like that. Once that step is done, it's going to pass that data onto a vertex shader. And the goal of the vertex shader is to get the points from an imaginary 3D space into screen space so that they can then be rendered on the screen. And once it is done with that step, it will pass this onto the fragment shader, which is the kind of final step of this process, which takes all of your point data and rosterizes it. It figures out what triangles exist on the screen, and you're writing code in a language called GLSL to determine what color you want each pixel to be or what visual effects you want applied to each pixel on the screen. So the collection of these three objects is called a shader program. And the GPU can have many of these stored in memory at one time. And OpenGL will allow your CPU code to ask the GPU to run one of these specific programs with the current state of data that exists in the GPU. So this is kind of just a little overview of the things that I've just said. Um, and the takeaway from this slide here is that there are actually some additional shaders that we'll get into later. Um, they're called compute shaders, and they allow you to execute arbitrary GLSL code that uh, modifies the current state of GPU memory. And you can do these invocations at any step in the pipeline. So like this previous slide is showing, this linear uh, progression of programs, um, there's actually some additional shaders that we can kind of inject into that process and invoke at any time. And we're going to take advantage of those to run our agent-based simulations and really get a lot of performance out of what the GPU is doing. Um, so I'm going to talk about why we need to use compute shaders and kind of what they are doing. Um, one of the points that Steve mentioned earlier is that if you want your code to be performant, you really need to figure out a way to represent as much of that data on the GPU at one time. It's really slow to be transferring data from the CPU to the GPU continuously. So if you want to have millions of agents, you can't make millions of transfers and expect your result to be performant. So what we do is have a really large array of memory that lives in the GPU. And then we kind of send all of the data to the GPU initially and ask it to access very specific parts of that global buffer 
and modify that buffer on the GPU. So all of your simulation data is gonna live completely on the GPU instead of needing to transfer between the CPU and GPU continuously. Um, we can access this large buffer of memory in a few different ways. Uh, shader programs have these variables called uniform variables, which are structures that are allowed to be set once before the shader program is invoked and can uh, change between shader invocations. They also have input and output variables, which are pieces of data that are transferred directly between the shaders. So any of the points in the previous slide where I had a blue arrow, you might have your input and output variables um, be represented there. So it would be data that's directly taken and expected to be produced by a previous shader, and it just kind of flows into the next shader implicitly. Um, and then the final like variable that we can represent in shaders are built-in variables. And those are kind of just constants that you would put in a shader program. So if you had a very static thing that really wasn't gonna change at all, you could represent it entirely in GPU memory by just using built-in variables. But the downside of that is that it would just be static. You really couldn't change what was happening. So I'm going to now show a little example of what an invocation of the shader pipeline might look like. So if you had five agents that you might want to render on the screen. In a traditional rendering method, we would need to do a specific invocation for each agent on the screen. So each of these spheres on the screen, if we're going to represent those as a different agent or robot or whatever, we would need to have five draw calls to get this scene to be produced. Um, because the data on the screen isn't the same. You can see that there's a different position for each of these agents. There's a different color for each of these agents. So we would need to specify that change before we rendered each of these individual agents. So it might take something like five draw calls. And uh, the kind of downside of this is that it, it's, it's pretty slow to render these things in this way um, because we're doing so many transfers between the CPU and GPU. So I'm gonna talk about how this idea would scale to like a concrete example. This is an implementation of Conway's Game of Life, which is a cellular automata where each cell is its own agent and it needs to be aware of its neighbors in order to kind of update and, and render itself correctly. So if we were to follow this line of thinking, we have about 100 agents in width and about 50 agents in height, which means it would take around 5,000 draw calls to render this scene. Um, if we did it in the most naive approach, which would be incredibly slow. But there are actually ways that we can accelerate this. Uh, there's a technology called instance rendering, which we can use to ask the GPU to render multiple instances of the same data that we already have there. So traditionally, when you do a draw call, uh, the GPU thinks that it needs to consume all of the information to render a frame. It kind of doesn't believe that it has anything in GPU memory that could be used to process the draw call that you're asking it to do. But with instance rendering, you're telling the GPU, you're making almost an assertion that it actually already has all the data that it needs and it should just draw 5,000 instances of the thing that you're asking it to draw. So if we follow down this line of thinking, we would be able to represent this whole screen Oh, I thought that there was another slide between there. Uh, we would be able to represent the whole screen with a continuous draw call. We would be able to tell it that it actually already has all the information that it needs to render this whole scene. And then instead of 5,000 individual transfers between the CPU and GPU, you would just need to do one where the CPU is asking the GPU to draw a frame. So that is an incredible performance increase because now we're potentially only rendering the scene in one draw call, but there's actually some downsides to structuring your data in this way that if you're not careful can lead to some problems. So here, if we had logic that was asking every agent to update its state based on a neighbor, and we were only using a single instance draw call to render that to the screen, we're going to have a problem. So if the very specific logic that we're asking is if your neighbor is filled, become filled on each of these cells, after one draw call, you're going to be reading and writing to the same block of memory, and there's no guarantee that it happens in a specific order. So the effect that that is going to cause is that you don't know the order that your cells are going to be filled in, and it's not uh, like stepwise, it's, it's a continuous operation where the entire screen would execute that logic and you would have your leftmost cells 
uh, realize that they have a neighbor that is filled, become filled. And then as the draw call progresses, you're going to have more cells read their neighbors as filled and become filled themselves. So this has an effect where the whole screen will become filled in one draw call, which isn't really the behavior that we want here. So the solution to this problem, which is done implicitly in this framework that we're developing, is uh, double buffering any read and write actions. This is the process of using a different buffer for data that you're reading and a different buffer for data that you're writing. So you have a read buffer and a write buffer, and you switch them at the end of a frame. This effect, uh, the, the effect that this has is that now the action of writing to the grid is cached by a single frame. So the neighbors of the initial cells will update after the first draw, and the neighbors of the second cells will update after the next call. And it just makes the execution logic a lot more predictable, and it can have the effect that you're trying to have now, where this kind of like wave progresses across the screen rather than, than the entire screen becoming filled entirely at once. Um, so with those kind of high level ideas applied into a framework, we're able to represent millions and millions of agents in a buffer of GPU memory, where we actually have two copies of that buffer in GPU memory, and we're implicitly switching between those two buffers every frame to kind of obscure that low level implementation from the user. So you don't really need to think about it. You can just figure out how much data each of your agents needs to have. Um, use our API to construct an agent struct with that specific data representation, and then tell it how many instances of those agents that you want. And it will kind of just run that logic implicitly, parallelized, and give you really performant results. So this is a, a blown up version of that picture from earlier. And I have another one on the next slide. And then I have some interesting videos that we can look into um, that kind of show this executing in real time. So I'm going to try to transition to playing a video here. Um, I'm going to show an implementation of the Fasarum simulation, which is a multi-agent simulation where every single agent on the screen uh, looks at its neighbors and it figures out which side has more neighbors. So this is about a million agents running and the only logic that they are executing is if you have more neighbors on your left side, turn left, and if you have more neighbors on your right side, turn right. And that leads to some very interesting behaviors and this mimics how slime molds actually propagate and grow. Um, so, this is just a really interesting example of a complex behavior that arises from a small set of rules. And we think that a simulation like this could be adapted to something like swarm robotics specifically, where you have a bunch of agents that need to know their neighbor's positions and a bunch of other data from their neighbors. And we could represent that entirely on the GPU and do really, really performant operations and calculations on the state of the world to make informed decisions that will prevent problems or collisions or solve whatever problem is interesting to this swarm robotics instance. Um, another video that I can share really quick here is an implementation of the game of life. Um, I think it's this one. So we have the ability to render into an off-screen buffer so we can have imaginary screen sizes. So this is zooming into a frame of the game of life, which is a um, cellular automata where cells will turn on or off depending on uh, the state of their neighbors. So if I am able to play this here, sorry about that. There we go. I just kept missing the play button. Uh, this is me zooming into what looks like noise, but when we get really into it, it's actually a 12,000 by 12,000 grid of agents. Uh, this is just a single frame, but this was running at about 100 frames per second. Um, the video compression just kind of makes this look like a gray blob if we try to show it running in real time. So that's why I took a single frame and zoomed into it. But if your domain is not able to be represented by the confines of a traditional screen, there's ways to make these imaginary buffers of memory that are the size and domain of uh, whatever your application is. So this, this is a, a really large amount of agents. And I'm going to kind of end what I'm showing here with an example of 100 million agents. This actually might be 130 million agents, which is the most that we were able to represent on uh, GPU currently. Um, 
just because we're not able to index into our memory array by more than the size of an integer. So um, we couldn't represent the bytes that we needed to without exceeding the integer limit. So there's only 100 million agents here because each agent is more than a byte wide. But if we did some different like memory management techniques or optimized our agents to be smaller, we might be able to get even more agents on the screen. So this is, this is about 130 million agents. Um, and it's the same as the green simulation from before, just with a different input seed. And the lines are much more concentrated now because there's so many agents overlapping. Um, so we're really interested in this type of technology. And we think we're doing some really interesting things with it. And this is uh, what we have now. It's, it, I think it's pretty interesting. And I, I really like showing it. So thank you for taking the time to look at this. Bailey, thank you so much for an intriguing look at some leading edge technology. And you'll notice Steve has jumped back on. I'm gonna ask Bailey to stay. Uh, we're gonna do a quick poll. And as we're doing the poll, I'm gonna mention that we're heading into our Q&A session. Uh, the questions are flying in. We're gonna get to as many as we can within the time constraints. But rest assured, if you ask the question, if we don't answer it now live, we will absolutely get back to you with an answer. Uh, after the webinar. So the first question I'm gonna to put to the team, how can you determine if your app can benefit from GPU acceleration? So I have an idea of how you can determine that. Um, if you find that whatever logic you're doing has loops in it, you can almost definitely parallelize that logic. Even if the order that the loops need to execute in is uh, like fixed, there are different buffering strategies that you can do like double buffering to split up the individual tasks that you're trying to do so that it is parallelized. Um, basically, any, the, any times you're trying to do the same action over and over and over again with slightly different inputs like the index of an array or things like that, there are almost definitely ways you can implicitly accelerate that with the GPU. Um, mm -hmm. And and also pretty much uh, in specifics, anything that's either modeling, uh, um, manipulating sets of 3D coordinates or 2D video is almost always a candidate for, for optimization because you can s split that down into um, smaller subsections and, and run them all in parallel. All right, let's drill a little deeper. Other than machine learning, graphics, and crypto, what are some good uses for GPU acceleration? Um, one that comes to mind right off the bat is medical imaging. Uh, if you imagine that when you're doing uh, ultrasounds or, or any kind of thing where you're looking at a dynamic video, not only can you use GPU acceleration to enhance the quality of that, that video that you're seeing on the fly, but you can then apply a uh, neural network-based AI on top to help guide the, the process as well. And also analyzing static images like x-rays or MRIs. And what's fascinating about this is that these are life-saving technologies. If you can do that, uh, it, it, the the world will beat a path to your door if you can save lives. Excellent, excellent. Another question. Are there technologies that let someone transition from GPUs to other hardware, for example, FPGAs, and back again without starting a project over from scratch? New technologies from the Kronos group, like uh, Cycle or Sickle, I'm not entirely Cycle. sure how to pronounce it. Um, <laughs> Do you know, Steve? <laughs> it's sickle, yes. Okay, yeah. And that will kind of implicitly allow you to do exactly that, transfer your project between different target hardware. Um, and and I what I would add to that is that there's a trade-off between generality and and um, that that if you are targeting a specific environment for for example if you're only worried about N Nvidia processors the advantages of using CUDA which is Nvidia's specific language for their own GPUs is that it's tuned to optimize the performance of that GPU and at a higher level you can understand what the bottlenecks are and and tune your software itself to, to do that. Where um, the the more general purpose languages that bring you all of that, that ability to do heterogeneous computing, to use multiple 
uh, piece hardware at the same time, but that comes at a certain cost of now you can't, you, you can't, you're not quite as close to the hardware. So there are trade-offs involved, but there's uh, uh, Sickle and, and some of the other things that are coming out are, are wonderful um, in, in that they allow you to, to mix and match various computing devices and, and dynamically. Great. Another question uh, that we have here, uh, I think it's more basic. How hard is it? to add GPU acceleration to a legacy application? Not necessarily that hard. One, one thing I should say about it, it, it's easy to get intimidated by all of the tips about what you need to do to, to make a GPU run most optimally. Then the reality is that you can get a tremendous amount of work done with often the most uh, a very simple approach. When you look at, at what goes into a CUDA kernel, for example, you're just writing a piece of software that says, take this sample on the screen and do something to it. And so conceptually, you can write very simple code that, that very much resembles what you have to do with what, what you're doing in, in C already and or, or, or whatever language you're in. And so there's some some modifications, but architecturally, it's very easy to to plug GPU support into into many existing applications. Is there any compute software? that makes use of more than just the shader unit for general compute. For example, does anyone use the tessellator for something compute related? Things like LiDAR data, you could probably use the tessellation shader to implicitly connect the points. That's the only thing that directly comes to mind for me. Like anytime that you would have data that has a uh, analog to something that is done in games, you could almost definitely use part of the GPU that was developed for that application in games to do the same thing in the real world. So like games are really optimized for uh, level of detail scaling. And maybe that is really interesting in like a point cloud environment or to take like ground penetrating radar data or something like that and limit the sample point to be averaged. You could definitely leverage parts of the GPU that are um, designed for the more game-specific implementations of those same ideas to the real world instead. Mm -hmm. And to that, I would just add, yes, GPUs have a lot of custom circuitry that isn't that, that goes beyond just their ability to do things in parallel. And one example is in a vertex shader that that um, if you are if you are trying to render a triangle in OpenGL, there's actually a hardware interpolation unit that is running there that that that's mapping colors. So you can just specify three colors as the three endpoints of a triangle, and there's a piece of hardware that will do that interpolation for you. So I think that in order to take advantage of those things, you really need to use languages that are specific to the GPU you're, you're trying to to use, or 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 features like that that OpenGL supports across a variety of GPUs. But there's a ton of things under the hood that may not be apparently obvious. With that, I'm gonna thank Steve and Bailey. We'd be happy to have a conversation and give our advice, opinions, and thoughts as to how you can optimize your GPU applications. Thanks again, we appreciate your time. Uh, Geisel Software thanks you, and we hope to see you again at the next webinar that we offer. Thank you so much.